2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 13. Paul is continuing uh, in instructing Timothy on the importance of not giving up, of enduring the difficulties and the challenges of being a follower of Christ, of not turning his back on the faith as so many were doing at the time while the church is under severe persecution of not giving in to his natural temp- temperament, his default setting of timidity or physical weakness or youth. But Paul is calling Timothy to be, as we look, considered last week, like the soldier who, who fights the good fight. He calls him to be like the athlete who runs for the prize according to the rules. He calls him to be like the farmer who continues to till, till the ground until it produces crops. Now he's going to get into three examples that are going to continue to feed into this primary truth that the best things in life come at a cost, that nothing worth having comes easily, essentially, that we need a spirit of stick that we need to endure, that we must suffer and suffer rightly. So he says in verses 8 through 13, he says, remember, Timothy, when you're suffering, (laughs) remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. And here he gives uh, Timothy, he uses this phrase, this saying is trustworthy. Uh, He's giving Timothy now a a piece of an old, ancient, believed to be an ancient hymn from the early church. Uh, He says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. It's fascinating. We love that last verse. 13, 2 Timothy, chapter two is money. Whenever ever, ever someone's like really struggling or feeling like they're plagued with doubt or they've been really bombing it for Jesus, we just tell them, hey, If we're faithless, he remains faithful. It's fascinating that we never connect it with the verse right before that. Like when someone's really suffering, we don't say, or really ashamed of the gospel, you don't generally pull out verse 12. You just skip that one and pretend it's not there. We don't say, hey, listen, if you deny him, he's going to deny you. I'm going to start using that. I'm never going to use 13 again. Um, at least not we're going to use it out of context. So what I'm going to say is the context that Paul means it. Hey, if you deny him before men, he's going to deny you before the Father. And I promise you, he's faithful to be faithful to his word, which is the meaning of the text. It's a little more painful, isn't it? Gosh, we love to use and misuse the word to make ourselves feel better. Well, this text is not so much about making us feel better, but it is about giving us a foundation, a foundation for a universal truth, a truth that cannot be escaped if you're a human being. And that is, is that to be human is to hurt. To be human is to suffer. We will suffer at our own thinking. We will suffer at the hands of others. We will suffer by the world around us. We will suffer by watching the suffering of the world. We will suffer in our attempts to avoid suffering. That suffering is an inescapable reality. And one of the great lies um, that has been put forth about Christianity and even sometimes by Christians is that the gospel is 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 a message of good news, good news about how to escape pain. But if you were doing what I'm doing right now, which is reading your Bible daily, which you should be doing as a Christian, Is there anywhere from Genesis to Revelation uh, that gives you the impression that living rightly before God and before others is a way of escaping pain? Crickets. Uh, Is that because you're not sure of the answer or because you know the answer and it's a dumb question? 
Does the gospel ever provide an out from suffering? No, it does not. Thank you. That was such a good, that was a good direct no. I appreciate that. <laughs> In a world of fearful no's or, or uh, ironic no's, I appreciate the directness of that statement. Religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of a soulless condition. It is the opium of the people. Who said that? Karl Marx. How well did communism play itself out in the 20th century? The idea that the opium of the people is what we have been given as, as Christians, is a means of, of, of satisfying the restless, um, inflicted heart, afflicted heart. Uh, we have created an escape for ourselves. But is that ever what Jesus said? What Jesus said is he says, in this world you will have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they are to pick up their cross. A cross is an instrument of what? Of death, of torture, of pain. He says, pick up their cross and let them follow after me. If anyone refuses to deny their mother or their father or their brother or their sister or their, their husband or their wife or their son or their daughter, they are not worthy of being my disciples. Again and again, from the lips of Jesus himself, he declares that to follow him is costly. When people say, Josh, what will it cost me to follow Jesus? The only honest answer is that it'll cost you everything. It's the only honest answer. But the part that is missed by the critic of religion, or the critic of Christianity, is that for us, the suffering that we endure for Christ is the means to the joy and the meaningfulness and the, and the importance of a future hope that actually is discovered through entering in, not only to the suffering that, uh, of accepting our own sin, but the suffering that comes from actually being willing to enter into the brokenness of others. To suffer rightly, in other words, is to accept responsibility not only for one's own sin, but also for the sins of others. One who is willing to suffer for Christ's sake must be willing moreover to suffer fools. I'm reading right now uh, a book with some staff members, a famous book by many uh, standards believed to be the greatest novel ever written. I, I don't know if I can state that as far as enjoyment level, but it's called Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. Um, I, I tried it actually about 10 years ago while I was in Russia um, and I gave up because the language is challenging. It's not fun. It's Dostoevsky is very claustrophobic. It's a little archaic. I don't generally enjoy things before the 20th century. I'm not a Victorian fan. Um, I don't know if I would call Dostoevsky Victorian. Uh, it's just straight up Russian. Uh, and so culturally, uh, it's different. The time period is different. But the subject matter this time, I'm, I'm allowing myself to embrace it. And yesterday I sat and I read 100 pages of it in one sitting. And that's a lot of Dostoevsky in one sitting. Let me just tell you, it took me hours. Um, I actually broke the rule. I read more of the novel than I did of the scripture. Um, but I got sucked into the depth of the characters and this crazy web that he builds around this family, the Karamazov family. Uh, there's Fyodor, the father, who's an absolute scoundrel. You hate him. You hate him from the first page. Everything he says, you just wish he would shut up and disappear forever in the book. Um, he is a man who lives, Dostoevsky purposefully paints the picture of a man who lives totally by his appetites, a man who lives so carnally, so selfishly that he forgets his sons the moment they're born, a man of wealth, a man who fights with his oldest son, Dmitri, over the love of a woman named Grishenka. I'm only, I'm only to book six, so I don't even know how it ends. All I know is I'm far enough in to know that this guy I don't think will ever be liked. I'm not going to finish this novel and go, that guy was awesome. 
He's really well drawn because he really makes me dislike him greatly. The oldest son, Dimitri, is a man most like his father. He is also a man that's driven by, by his sensuality, this, by, his, by his appetites. In fact, he even confesses to the youngest brother, Elosha, that, that he no longer is going to fight the urges of the flesh. He's going to give himself to them fully, even if it hurts others around him. The middle brother, Ivan, is the intellectual, the one who, who wrestles with belief in God, and it comes to the conclusion that, that God must not exist, or if he does, I have to give him back the ticket, the pass. Uh, and, and he is a man who is driven, and you can see him already, the seeds of insanity setting in uh, as he suffers from watching the suffering of the world from a detached position. And I think that he is the key component in Dostoevsky's masterpiece, uh, along with the youngest brother, Alosha. And I believe it's these two that feed the parallels or the, or the poles in the novel, because Alosha, the youngest one, is a monk and one of great faith. And Dostoevsky said of him that he is the hero of the novel. It's funny that many fans of the book that sit outside of Christianity, like Camus, uh, like Nietzsche, um, believe that Alosha really wasn't the hero. He's an anti-hero because he doesn't actually do anything, because he's young, because he primarily listens rather than speaks. But they misunderstand the heart of Christianity. The reason that Alosha is the hero is because his sanity rests in his absolute ability to give himself fully to those whom he's in contact with. And that his brother's insanity, who is the most like a person like Nietzsche, his insanity is his willingness to look at the suffering of the world without offering any solutions, nor willing to get his hands dirty in it. At least this is my reading of it up to this point. In fact, he says at one point, right before the great chapter, which I read yesterday called The Grand Inquisitor, uh, he is speaking with his brother, uh, and he says, for love... From love for humanity, I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with your faith. I would rather be left with the unavenged suffering. I would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation, even if I were wrong. Besides, too high a price is asked for harmony. It's beyond our means to pay so much to enter on it. And so I hasten to give back my entrance ticket. And if I'm an honest man, I am bound to give it back as soon as possible. And that I am doing. It's not God that I don't accept, Alosha. Only I most respectfully return him the ticket. That's rebellion murmured Elosha, looking down. That's rebellion. His brother goes on a rant about the suffering of innocent children in the world, and he says, even if hell is real, what's that going to do to stop the suffering of the kids? How is it going to fix what's, what's already been hurt? It doesn't do anything. I want justice now, not in the future. His questioning about the meaning of suffering is the problem of his insanity because he wants to understand suffering, but he does not want to be a participant in its solution. And I believe that this is the essence of why it is that all people suffer, but most people suffer wrong. Because in our modern context, what drives us today is our attempts at keeping our hands clean from the suffering of others, and all we do is create inner turmoil, inner pain, inner anxiety. As we try to protect ourselves from pain, all we do is create it because it is not good that man be alone. And we have, driven, we have been driven by the age which says you are the central, most important thing in existence. And yet that great satanic lie has brought more unhappiness than any lie in human history. It is our attempts to protect ourselves from pain that creates so much deep despair, despairful suffering, that, a suffering that is wrong, a suffering that does not lead to life but leads to insanity. And what I want us to see today is that the gospel does not avoid suffering, but it gives us the ability to make use of it in a way that brings us into life, into purpose, into hope. So I encourage you guys to read that book. It's long, it's weird, but it's good. So what does Paul say to Timothy? 
What does Paul say to Timothy about suffering? He says, listen, Timothy, I know. He's already pointed out that he is suffering from the gospel. He's saying, Timothy, you're not going to be able to avoid the suffering of the gospel. You're, gonna, you're going to experience the heartbreak of people hurting you. You're going to experience the anxiety of persecution. You're going to see people actually put to death for their faith. How do you stay steadfast in it? It's not by retreat, but it's by a willingness to actually enter into the pain and the suffering of others. And he says, first and foremost, Timothy, if you want to be one who overcomes, if you want to suffer rightly, you've got to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The offspring of David is preached in my gospel. It's interesting that he uses that statement. It seems so obvious. I mean, if you're a Christian, shouldn't everything be about Jesus? But that's not what we tend to do as Christians. In fact, I often find that the Christian faith, one of the first things to go from Christianity is Christ. But it's been said, no cross, no crown. I would say, no cross, no Christ. And so if we remove the cross from Christ, that is, avoidance of suffering, Christianity becomes indeed what Karl Marx said, which is that it becomes an opium of the people if we actually create a Christ after our own likeness, a Christ that brings happiness and gives us everything we ever wanted. Listen, Jesus is not your cosmic Santa Claus. He's not here to fulfill your dreams. He's here to fulfill his purposes and his plans. And you can be a part of that plan by your absolute and total surrender to him. So when Paul says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, he's not talking about, remember that thing that happened back then. He says, remember your risen present king. It's fascinating. The entire gospel is wrapped up in this statement by Paul to Timothy. Because if you think about it first in his person, the words descended from David or the offspring of David implies his humanity, for they speak of his earthly descent from David. But the words risen from the dead implies his divinity for he is powerfully designated what? God's son by his resurrection. His death for the sins of humanity and the resurrection from the dead shows that he was who he said he was. He was the God-man. But secondly, Paul's declaration that he is to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, who is the offspring of David, shows his work as well. And I think that this is crucial in understanding how it is that Paul is encouraging Timothy to endure suffering for the sake of Christ, because Jesus himself was what? the suffering servant. He was the suffering servant. He was the son of sorrows. We are told in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, that Jesus, the Son of God, learned obedience by what he suffered. That what makes the gospel compelling is that it's not a detached God, one who is immune to the pain and suffering of humanity, making demands over our lives, worship me, submit to me, but it is a God who actually enters into the very fabric of our brokenness, one who meets us in our lowest point, our sin, and he makes it his own. In fact, what we're told in the gospel, um, what we're told is that Jesus, for, what what did it say? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy that would cause him to suffer so deeply? You. That Jesus was willing to actually enter into the total in broken frailty of human existence and take that brokenness so completely into himself. And he did it all so that he could be with you and that you could be with him. And why Paul is telling Timothy, he says, listen, Timothy, you need something solid to build upon. If you're going to suffer rightly for the gospel, you need to understand that your king is the trailblazer. He is your sympathetic high priest. You cannot accuse God of not understanding. You can't say what the critic, what Ivan essentially says of God in in my interpretation of Brothers Karamazov is that if God is good, then he cannot be God. And if God is God, then he cannot be good. But Paul says, no. When we look to Jesus, we say we cannot understand 
the totality of human suffering, nor are we called to understand it in its fullness, but we can trust that our God is good by his willingness to enter into all that is bad and his willingness to make it his own. So what Paul says to Timothy is, listen, Timothy, you've got to remember that Jesus has conquered the greatest enemy of human existence, which is death. He's risen from the dead. That you don't have to be afraid of what this world can do to you. I myself am a prisoner awaiting my own execution for standing in the gap and proclaiming that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And Paul was about to be murdered for that declaration, for that statement of faith. And he stood by it. He lived it. He gave himself for it. And he did it because Jesus was with him. Because the Jesus he worshiped was not a God who was dead and buried, but a God who conquered death and rose from the dead. And this is why he says, remember Jesus risen from the dead. And I think he puts in the offspring of David to remind him that he is the rightful king, but more importantly, that he is human and he understands your human weakness. You can trust him. I think it's important too to understand that when Paul says to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, he's telling Timothy something more than think upon him. He's telling him to remember who it is that, it, that has purchased him, who it is that he belongs to, who it is that he is called to live like, who it is that he is called to participate in his kingdom purposes, that he is a good soldier of Jesus means that he must remember that Jesus is with him, for him, will never leave him nor forsake him. And I think it's important because in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, if we say we abide in him, we can't say that we remember Jesus if we refuse to walk like him. To follow Jesus means to walk like Jesus, to engage in the things that Jesus engaged in. So Paul is giving a very deep statement in, in a very few words. He's saying, Timothy, you remember Jesus is another way of saying, remember the Jesus who is with you, who you have given your allegiance to, who you are called to obey no matter what. Because he was obedient to the point of death so that you could live fully alive in him today. Not only does he say, remember your risen present king in verse eight, but then he goes on to say this. He says, follow my example. He says, for this gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains is a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything. Notice this. I am enduring all of these things, not only for the love of Jesus, but because I love Christ and because Christ loves me, I cannot separate my love of Christ for, uh, from the love of people. And he says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Does Paul know who's elect and who's not elect? And what is he talking about here? He's talking about specifically the community of faith, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul is saying, Timothy, look at my life. Not only remember Christ, but look at my example. Look at how I have lived and look at what I am enduring right now for this gospel. Nothing has robbed me of my joy. Nothing has robbed me of my purpose. I have finished the good fight. I have, I have endured and I am ready to receive, as we'll see at the end of this letter, the glory that is awaiting me, the glory of being with Jesus face to face. This central emphasis upon living out the gospel means primarily living fully for others. I think this is important because one of the challenges in Christianity today is that we intellectualize our faith to the point of it being of no earthly help to anyone. You know, it's been said that we can be so spiritually minded we're of no earthly help. I think that we're so earthly minded we're of no spiritual or earthly good. And what Paul is calling us to realize is that we can't call ourselves Christians because of the sermons that we take in or I can't call myself a Christian because of the sermons that I give. I cannot 
call myself a follower of Jesus and refuse to love the people that Jesus has placed before me. And how I love cannot be simply what is declared from behind the pulpit on Sunday morning, but it must be represented in how I give myself during the week, during each and every day. I woke up this morning at 4 a.m., and I was so heavy-hearted because I spent all this time reading and preparing this message. And listen, I'm a 43-year-old man who, like most modern people, spends way too much time in his mind. A man who is obsessed with the failures of yesterday and obsessed with the fears of tomorrow and how quickly we lose the moment. And we live so intellectually and so wrapped up in what we're thinking and thinking rightly that we forget that it's not primarily about what we think, but it's about how we live. And what's so powerful about this passage is that Paul was a man of great thought, but his great thought was never disconnected from a life lived fully for others. He didn't see people as a disruption to his ability to comprehend the meaning of existence. He saw people, others, as the means of filling out the meaning of existence. Why is Elosha the sane one in the brothers Karamazov? Because he is one who finds the meaning of existence in existing for others. I was deeply hurt by this passage, hurt by the fact that I so often deny Christ by the ways that I refuse to love others. The ways that I get broken and upset about the pain that I see in the world around me, but am unwilling to actually, I can think about it, I can analyze it, I can create, I can synthesize it into my thought process, but what do I do to actually act differently because of it? You guys ever see um, that movie uh, with, um, what's his name? Is it Donald Sheed? It's called Hotel Rwanda. You guys, you guys see that? Remember that really intense scene where they, they were, they were they're like, it's being reported. The genocide is being reported. And I just remember being haunted by this scene. He, said, he, he says, it's being reported. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen is Americans are going to look up from their dinner plates and they see there's this horror. And they'll be like, that's awful. And then they're just going to go back to their meal. And I think that this is one of the challenges is that we are the most informed and the least Im and the most empty. We know more than has ever been known, known before, but we live less. I think we live less. I was thinking about the joys of suffering and the ways that we avoid suffering and analyze it from a distance but keep our hands clean. And I think that this is one of the, the challenges. I was remembering the greatest joys I've known as a Christian have been the times of when I have been willing to enter in to the suffering of others selflessly. I wish that they were so endless I couldn't even think of an example, but they're so few that I've got a couple really good ones. But I remember about five years ago when my friend Steve Brand was dying of cancer. Steve is was the husband of my wife's best friend of the last 25 years, Mindy. Uh, Steve didn't like me. At least I never got the impression he liked me. He's a super well-loved teacher here in Portland, uh, intellectual, liberal, uh, and was completely leery of my Christianity. Uh, he met Mindy and started dating her right when I came to faith, before my wife was even a believer. And so all he knew of me was this guy who got radically saved and was weird because of it. I even sang at his wedding, and even then he kept me at arm's length. But when Steve got sick with cancer, uh, he, the barriers and the walls between him and I began to break down. And toward the end of his life, uh, he died in December, uh, December 24th of 2011. Uh, he, he really began to reach out to me when he knew that the end was, uh, was not something that could be escaped. And, and, and in his reaching out to me, he began to push out everything that mattered to him. It's amazing uh, how real suffering can show you what really matters. Because for him, at the end of his life, what he recognized, the most important question that needs to be answered, and really life comes down to a couple key questions when you know it's going to end at any moment. And that is, what's going to happen when I die? He was haunted by the eternal question. 
He was haunted by the God question, and so much so that he, he couldn't even handle seeing his wife and his girls, uh, his three daughters, because they just reminded him of what he was losing and his own fear of his own mortality, or even worse, the fear of immortality, but not having right relationship with his creator just overwhelmed him to the point where he reaches out to the guy he thought was annoying and obnoxious, and I am both of those things. And Steve began to open up to me, and I began to go, and I would make time every day the last few weeks, I would just go sit with him. And it wasn't always convenient, and honestly, I'm a man who likes to have fun, and it's not fun to sit with someone who's dying of cancer, to watch a healthy 195-pound man be whittled away to 95 pounds and look like a Holocaust victim, to hear the incredibly uncomfortable sound of the death rattle of someone who is breathing in and their body can hardly even handle taking in a breath and then for them to stop breathing for like a minute while you wait and count hoping that they'll take another breath and that they won't die while you're sitting there sitting there with him in that in the midst of that suffering was so far outside of my comfort zone but at the same time Jesus was never more real because I watched a man cry out for God, and the last day that he spoke, he accepted Christ into his life. And I had this small part as, as one who is simply a herald of the king to share the gospel with him, to share that God loved him, to see him accept, accept Jesus was so rewarding. But was it easy? No. To think back in seasons in my life where my life was so busy with all the people of Door of Hope that I didn't have time to read for hours every day. And at times I felt like I was even scrambling to put together a sermon, but it was good that I was out of time for my sermon because I had actually spent so much time with the people. God was always gracious to give me what I needed. But then to sit years later and to find myself on some weeks sitting alone, thinking and meditating and contemplating and to not engage and to not be known and not to know is it's wrong it's not what the gospel's about and i think why paul can say so firmly listen i am suffering for this gospel bound with chains as a criminal i actually read these words as one who speaks victoriously that there's these words, although they're marked by pain, they are also marked by an immovable joy. He says, but the word of God is not bound. God's word will continue to go out. I have played my part. I endure everything for the sake of the elect. I would lay down my life for those, and Paul would lay down his life for those that he didn't even know, didn't even know because the gospel had so grabbed a hold of him. He saw the key to living well was living for something outside of himself. He goes on to say this. He says, live by these words. This saying is trustworthy. If I have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I don't believe that these, these words are given to Timothy to scare him into the idea that he can lose his salvation, but he can most definitely lose his usefulness as a disciple. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, has much been debated. Is he talking about eternal destiny? Well, I don't think he's talking to eternal destiny when he's talking specifically. It says that, it says, in seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying. And what does he say to them? He says, listen, difficult is the path that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Narrow is the road. Difficult is the path. But he says, broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Is he talking about who's in and who's out? I believe what he's talking about is those who destroy their witness, destroy their testimony, create for themselves suffering that is unnecessary. It's what I call unhealthy, wrong suffering. Kill their witness. 
I think it's fascinating that he says this. He goes, if we died with him, and this isn't talking about that singular death of when you die, you, you, you die with Christ and you're born again, but I think it's the daily de death that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Lord, I die every day, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. He says, my pride is in you people, according to Jesus Christ, in whom I die every day. I die a thousand deaths for the good of those around me. That Paul recognized that the good death is the key to fullness of life. When Jesus says, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly, the abundance of his life comes through the good death, the willingness to die daily to the lie of who God never intended us to be. The rebellion of Ivan, according to Elosha, is his unwillingness to enter into the suffering of others, dying to himself. But instead he says, I will preserve myself, I will observe the suffering from afar, and I give back my right to be a child of God. I give him the ticket. I don't want it. So many live like that. But if we die with him, we will live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will deny us. He says, whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my father. You know, that verse is a really challenging verse. I remember the first time that I was asked to share my testimony. I had been a believer for a year I'd, or a year and a half. I'd gone to Russia on my first trip and I had, I had had the opportunity to share the gospel for the first time with someone and see someone respond to the gospel. It was amazing. Uh, and I came back and, and my pastor said, Josh, we're gonna do um, some open air preaching uh, in downtown Seattle. I'm like, it's like the worst thing I've ever heard of in my life. Like, what are you talking about? And, and he's like, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna, we're gonna rent a PA, and we're gonna have music. And he's like, I want you to get up and give your testimony. And I'm like, because I can't say no to anything, even things that I should, and that may have been one of them, uh, I, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And I, I said yes, but as part of it is I just didn't want to be pressured, and it was still, you know, two months away, so I didn't, but, you know, being the, the, the classic procrastinator I am, I was able to just put that out of my head and forget about it until the day it arrived. And then the day arrived, and I was, I had to go downtown. I remember going downtown, and there was a stage, and I remember walking out, and like, looking at what was happening, and it was so awkward. I can't even tell you. The music was bad. The, 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 just the, there were crowds, there were people like mocking. There were, there were like a couple homeless guys dancing in front of the stage, even when people were sharing. There was like another guy like yelling at people. It, it was like really thin. It wasn't like, oh, they've just flocked to hear us talk about Jesus. You know? So it was like, I'm not gonna say it was a successful outreach attempt. But nonetheless, I said I would get up and talk about how Jesus had changed my life. And so I was like, that is so lame and dumb. And so I ran back to the car garage where my car was, and I got in my car and I picked up my Bible, and I, I said, I, I literally, it's the first time ever, probably the last time I ever treated my Bible like a magic eight ball. I'm like, Lord Jesus, <laughs> show me a verse that will let me out of this right now. And I flipped it open. I'm not joking. I flipped it open. And I just stuck my finger on a verse, and it was this verse, Matthew 10. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies, denies me before... I'm not lying. It was like miraculous. I will deny before my Father who is in heaven, and I just shut, I shut my Bible, and I just started laughing, and I was like, in my mind, I'm like, you win, Jesus. You always do. <laughs> and I went out, and I, with fear and trembling, some mockery in the city that I got saved in, shared my testimony. And the reason that I, I share that with you is that, that what got me on that stage, was I afraid? Yes, very afraid. In fact, I'm positive I threw up in my mouth while I talked, like several times. I was afraid. Um, did I feel ashamed? I wasn't ashamed of Jesus, but I was ashamed of my own inability to articulate myself clearly. But that's the thing is that my love for Jesus trumped my fear and my embarrassment of, over the event, my fear of men. It's like, these people are willing to get up and do something. They, they have something they believe in. Most people walk through life without any sort of foundation. 
The only thing they believe in is in, the, in themselves. And, and we are doing this because we believe that we actually have a compelling answer for existence. And that truth caused me to put one foot in front of the other. And honestly, getting up on the stage that day set in motion what would be a life given to full-time ministry. And that's not necessarily what any of you or most of you will be called to. But it, but it does call us to recognize that we will not ever receive the confidence and the courage to enter into the gospel, the suffering of the world for the sake of Jesus Christ until we believe first and foremost that Jesus is everything that he said he is. And if we believe that, we're not gonna experience the fullness of it until we step out into the danger of putting ourselves on the line for the good of others. And I wanna live with more of that foolishness. I don't wanna be a man who sits around contemplating his navel. I want the things that I read to serve the people that I love and serve. I don't want Door of Hope to be a church that I love from a distance. I want you to be a community that I'm invested in, even if it exhausts me physically. I know that's true for the staff. I wanna be a man who lives out the love of Christ tangibly, intellectually, emotionally, physically. I wanna be a man whose life reflects Jesus. I wanna be able to say, with the Apostle Paul, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I want when people say, what is Jesus like? I wanna be able to say, imitate me. Doesn't that sound like a blasphemy? But that is exactly what Jesus wants for us. How do we do it? I think we'll close with this verse. How is Timothy to do it? Was Paul telling Timothy to pull himself up by his bootstraps? Try harder, work harder? Quit being, quit being afraid? No. Again and again, Paul uses these words. Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Notice it's, a, it's, a, it's an active strength that comes passively through time with Jesus. How did he start his challenge to Timothy? Remember who? Remember Jesus, Timothy. Jesus... The love of Christ, Paul writes, compels me. It is when we have a vision of Christ that we will have the willingness to enter into the world that he has created and that he gave himself for. It's when we stay close to Jesus that we will begin to see others the way that he sees them. It's when Jesus has so captured our imagination, so captured our hearts, that we will give ourselves away. We will risk our lives for him our unwillingness to risk our lives for others, our unwillingness to engage in the suffering of the world around us really speaks to the lack of vision that we have for the living Christ. I can do all things, Paul writes, through him who strengthens me. We cannot say, I'm a timid personality. I'm not smart enough. I can't do this, I can't do that. Jesus is in the business of taking the most unlikely candidates and doing great things. Greater things will you do than these, Jesus said to his group of loser disciples. And listen, we may be losers, and it's true. We're not bigger failures than Jesus already knows we are. But the power of the gospel is that gospel is in the business of taking broken people and making something beautiful out of it, of taking the mess of our lives. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for single-mindedness. It's a willingness to be the man, the woman who will stand in the gap and say, I don't know what I have to offer, but everything I am, I offer it. I don't know where my gifts lie, but if they're there, Jesus, make use of it. I am at your disposal. Enter into his world, into his suffering, and you will find life and joy door of hope, I want us to suffer rightly, to suffer for Christ, for it's the key to fullness of life. Amen? Let's pray.